Hey everybody, it's Party Elite, and today we're continuing our faction series for Age of Empires 4. If you missed my previous video about the Delhi Sultanate, I'll link the playlist in the description down below. And if you'd like to keep up with these videos as they release, don't hesitate to subscribe or join the Discord linked in the description as well. I plan on doing a fair bit of Age of Empires coverage on the channel. I've had the chance to play the game a fair bit in early access thanks to the developers providing me with a key, and though I think it's a bit early to start talking about the meta and all in a definitive sense, I hope these videos help give you an idea of how each faction plays, what makes them unique, and what those unique factors actually mean in-game. If you have any thoughts of your own to share or any questions, drop them in the comments down below. But without any more time to waste, let's begin our discussion on the Abbasid Dynasty, or Dynasty if you're so inclined. House of Wisdom The game, in my opinion, downplays how complex the Abbasid Dynasty can be. Right off the bat, their method of transitioning from era to era is unlike any other faction, and in my humble opinion, it puts a lot more pressure on a new player, or even a comfortable player, when facing a new matchup. Rather than accumulate resources to build a unique structure and enter a new age, you instead need to build the House of Wisdom and build additional wings at this House of Wisdom, one for each age you want to progress to. Once the wing has been built, not only do you enter the next age, but you gain access to one of these four columns of technology based on the wing you decided to build. The four columns line up with the four wings. The economic wing, the military wing, the culture wing, and the trade wing. And the three rows line up with the age in which the technology will be unlocked, starting with the second age, down to the third, and then the fourth. The construction of the wing itself gives you no benefits beyond entering the new age, where other factions might get at least some utility out of the construction of their landmark alone. The Abbasid dynasty only gets the option to spend more resources to actually glean any benefits. Now, that's not to downplay how helpful these techs can be. The economic wing can help make villagers cheaper to produce, improve their gather rate from farms, and help them drop off more resources. The military wing potentially sees your camels buff nearby infantry, gives camel riders shields for added melee armor, and increases infantry health as well. The culture wing options make tech significantly cheaper, can make keeps into a source of healing, and can allow your religious unit, the Imam, to convert single enemy units without a relic in hand. The trade wing, meanwhile, can help you earn more gold from traders, get more armor for traders and trade ships, and even add a new way to acquire essential resources alongside the gold that your traders will bring in. These are all helpful in various ways. The economic wing can be huge early on, saving crucial food that can be used to recruit units. The military wing is great if you intend to field camels to any degree. The culture wing makes keeps so much more useful in the mid and late game, and the trade wing makes trade all the more valuable, perhaps best saved for last. It all depends on your strategy and your opponent and your opponent's strategy, and that is why I say the Abbasid Dynasty can be a bit more complex than the game lets on. You're not making a binary choice every step of the way. You need to pick from one of four options to enter the second age, one of three to enter the third, and finally one of two to enter the fourth. And each of these wings gets subsequently more expensive as you go from age to age. The first wing is the cheapest to build, the second is pricier, the third the most expensive. Choose wisely every step of the way, but remember that you don't immediately get access to the entire column of technology, and that they're made available to research across the multiple ages instead. But that's not all the House of Wisdom is good for. It also helps bring about Golden Ages. The area of influence around the House of Wisdom can help you reach Golden Ages, and it also adds plus 5 fire armor to buildings built within that area of influence. The fire armor is pretty easily understood, so I won't take too much time on that, but let's focus on these Golden Ages instead. First, Keep in mind that the actual area of influence of the House of Wisdom isn't limited to the highlighted tiles around it when you're building it. It can be extended by the area of influence of other buildings that are touching it. So any adjacency bonuses apply not only to and from buildings that are on the House of Wisdom's own area of influence, but those that are in the area of influence of buildings that themselves are within the area of influence of the House of Wisdom as well. I know that sounds like a very complicated explanation, hopefully the visuals are making it crystal clear that the area of influence sort of passes from building to building, growing larger rather than staying restricted to the original footprint. 
You can tell if a building is within said area of influence when the area of influence gets highlighted during placement. Now, you'll want to try and get as many buildings within this area of influence as possible, so try to place the House of Wisdom in a relatively central location, using other buildings to extend its area of influence as needed. For example, if a gathering point is just a little out of reach, you can place a house between the gathering point and the House of Wisdom to get that gathering point within the area of influence. The reason you're doing this is to unlock Golden Ages, which in turn give you fairly significant buffs. Golden Ages are not temporary. Once unlocked, they last for as long as the conditions are fulfilled, and those conditions simply involve having larger and larger numbers of buildings within the area of influence for larger and larger buffs. An enemy destroying enough buildings within the area of influence can diminish or end your Golden Age, but if you're taking that kind of damage, chances are the game's just about over anyway. With 10 structures within the area of influence, there's a slight bump to resource gather rates. With 30 structures, there is an additional bump to those gather rates and a bump to research speeds as well. The Abbasid Dynasty doesn't suffer from slow base research speeds like the Delhi Sultanate does, and its base research times match the standard across other factions. So this increased research rate will put you ahead of the average enemy faction in terms of research times. Finally, with 60 structures in the area of influence, you'll see significant increases to gather speeds, research speeds, and production speeds too. Getting to that 60 buildings can make a world of difference, so again, try to keep buildings within the area of influence, expanding it as often as possible. Don't hesitate to build far off structures when needed though, such as gathering sites, but do try and connect them with houses or outposts or something that helps spread the area of influence. Keep in mind that only buildings that specify they add to the Golden Age structures actually do so. so no, palisades and stone walls and gates don't help, and there's no need to just spam them everywhere. Unless that's your method of defense, I suppose. Infantry Besiegers The Abbasid Dynasty infantry have a fairly significant advantage throughout the ages. Whether it's ranged infantry or melee, your infantry can build siege equipment without the need for any prerequisite technology from the blacksmith. While other factions need to first build a blacksmith and then research siege engineering to even have access to the battering ram or siege tower, your infantry will be able to build them right off the bat without the need for either of those prerequisites. This means that you have a bit of an advantage in closing the gaps against enemies that might be pumping out archers. While siege towers aren't really helpful until there are enemy walls to climb, battering rams can provide cover for up to 16 infantry units apiece, and when they've been unloaded, Battering rams can move on their own to damage buildings as their passengers occupy themselves with other things. If you want to do some early harassment, these early battering rams can be a godsend. With their 15 armor versus ranged, enemy archers can't do much damage too quickly unless they're in large numbers. Though, keep in mind that not only can enemy infantry cause some trouble, but that the slow speed of the battering rams means that the enemy archers can keep pulling away unless you effectively surround them or cut them off. While they don't cost an exorbitant amount of wood to produce, each battering ram does take up three population slots, so they're not the easiest thing to mass produce early on. But even one can help with some early harassment and just keeping infantry alive on an approach during early aggression. Not having to research an entire technology also helps save gold and time, but that goes without saying. Keep in mind that when the Third Age comes around, there is a continued advantage in being able to produce the Springald and the Mangonel at the hands of your infantry too. Yes, they still cost resources, but having your infantry produce these pieces of equipment means you don't need a siege workshop to make them, and even if you do have a siege workshop, it can focus on producing other units or on upgrading tech instead. The Mangonel is especially handy in causing damage to clumped up enemy units, and it can absolutely tip engagements in your favor unless your opponent is exceptional at micromanaging and keeping units separated. Beyond that, infantry being able to produce these units means you can build them at a place closer to the enemy without needing to build a siege workshop in the area. You can acquire siege equipment reinforcements much more quickly with a much lower investment. And since siege equipment is extremely slow, this can be quite the game changer. However you choose to use your siege equipment, and no matter what stage of the game you're in, if you're playing as the Abbasid Dynasty, don't forget to take advantage of these options. Camels for Cavalry 
The camel is a versatile tool for the Abbasid dynasty, spitting in the face of horse riders. Literally. Whether you're using camels from range or in melee, they passively reduce the efficiency of enemy horse riding cavalry, dropping their damage output by a whopping 20%, and melee camels deal an extra bit of damage against cavalry on top of applying that debuff. If your opponent is likely to go heavy on cavalry, don't hesitate to use this special camel capability to your advantage. Keep in mind that camels are typically slower than horses unless you upgrade them with the third age camel handling tech at the House of Wisdom. And of course, keep in mind that if sufficiently outnumbered, a camel rider will get obliterated. But if you're able to match your enemy horse to camel and bring some spearmen to boot, you should be able to easily overwhelm a cavalry heavy force. Camel archers also have an extra bit of damage output against light melee infantry, typically spears, so you can use them to nullify the threat that enemy spears would provide not only to themselves, but to your melee camels as well. Starting from the second age, the archery range gives you access to camel archers right off the bat, and as of the third age, you can get melee camel riders from the stable too. Apart from making enemy cavalry weaker, camels can also buff your own infantry through the use of technology from the House of Wisdom. I think establishing the military wing to enter the Third Age probably makes the most sense since that's when you're most likely to be churning out camels. You can buff infantry armor and you can improve melee armor for the camel riders themselves and between camel handling and camel barding available in the Third and Fourth Age respectively, with or without the military wing, you can get quite a bit of help in keeping your camels nimble and alive and they can in turn help keep your infantry alive too. With camel archers able to cause extra hurt to spears and camel riders able to cause extra hurt to cavalry, you have a pretty solid pairing to supplement the infantry walking around inside their battering rams. Very nice. Much like the Delhi Sultanate, the Abbasid dynasty is able to glean extra benefits from berry bushes, though they can't hunt or harvest meat from boar. Again, this is a representation of the fact that pork is haram and the only thing it really does is limit some of your hunting options by the most minimal amount. As with the Delhi Sultanate, I wasn't able to see evidence of faster harvest times from berry bushes, but it's quite clear to see that berry bushes provide twice as much food as they do for other factions as long as you've built a mill near those berry bushes. This means that you can wait quite a bit longer before you have to start relying on a farm economy. Now, while I suggested going out to berry bushes further and further away as the Delhi Sultanate, I think the Abbasid dynasty has less to gain in doing so until and unless they're establishing a new town center. The reason for this is simple. A far off mill can help acquire food and keep the need for a farm economy further away, but that's 50 wood spent on a mill that won't help add towards the golden age at the House of Wisdom. If there are berry bushes that are just a few steps away, that's one thing. You can easily close the gap in an area of influence with a few houses and an outpost, but if the nearest berry bushes are at a different corner of the map entirely, I'd hold off on over-investing in them. While farms don't count towards Golden Age structures themselves, at least you'll keep your villagers safe at home. Again, this is really situational. If there are berry bushes just a few steps over, maybe close to other resources that you'll want to build gathering points for in the area anyway, it makes a lot more sense since you can always put down, as I said, houses and outposts and maybe even larger buildings to close the area of influence gap. But if it starts to get too far away to close the gap, I think getting to the increased resource gather rate for all your resources sooner is better than holding off on building farms. So while the Abbasid dynasty has a similar benefit from berry bushes as the Delhi Sultanate, I think the use cases are at least slightly different at times, if not entirely so. And that's the Abbasid dynasty all wrapped up, a faction that I think is a little more complicated than the game lets on, if only for how their advancement through the ages works, and how it applies pressure on the player to make bigger decisions early on. I hope you found this helpful whether you're already familiar with the faction or not, and if you have any tips or thoughts of your own based on your own experience that you'd like to share down below, I'd love to see them. Let me know if you'd like more of this kind of coverage as well by leaving a like down below, and don't hesitate to subscribe if you'd like more strategy gaming previews, reviews, let's plays, guides, and more. As always, a massive thanks goes out to all of the channel members and patrons who've been supporting this channel on a monthly basis. Y'all keep us alive and running smoothly, and of course, a big ol' thanks goes out to each and every one of you for watching. Until next time, cheers.